How you doing? You know, I'm going to open a can of worms with this one, I think, all right? This one here is the big enchilada, amigos, all right? So and what, you have to forgive me in advance if, if this stings a little. You're going to you're gonna have to cut me a little slack if this convicts or challenges you because I'd never want to do that. No, what I'm about to talk about is things people don't like to talk about. It goes up there with religion and politics. It's one of those things you don't talk about if all you want to do is make friends. No, this one here, this is a little different because the love of this thing, the love of it, you know what I'm saying? is the root of all kinds of evil. But on the other hand, without it, you can't do much good, all right? You cracked the code yet? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, money, M-O-N-E-Y. Yeah, the almighty dollar, the cash, the cabbage, the greenbacks, the gravy, the loot, the moolah, whatever you want to call it. You know what I'm saying? I got my own personal favorite, the dead presidents. The higher number on the dollar bill, the goofier the president, the more hands want to touch it. Go figure. You know what? We ask a lot of questions about these presidential papers, don't we? Yeah. How are we going to spend it? How am I going to use it? My own personal favorite? Huh? Huh? How am I going to act like I don't have any so my relatives don't bother me anymore? Or how am I going to miss the offering plate every time it passes by? Yeah. Money. The big, big question. But there's one question we always leave out. At least I do. Whose is it? I mean, whose money is it really? That is the million dollar question, pardon the pun, right? I know some might say, hey, it's my money because I worked hard with these hands. Yeah? Who gave you the hands, buddy? All right, you're smarter than some who gave you the brains. You're driven who gave you the ambition. All right, I know you can arrange a lot of things on your own, but you can't tell me you arranged your birthplace, who your parents were, who your friends are going to be, what schools you went to, the technology that was going to be there, the people that came before you to pave the way, the people are here now to lighten the load. Huh, you didn't arrange that, did you? Should I go on? No, 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 I don't think so. You know, I suppose all I'm trying to say is this, people. All right, I got a big wake-up call last year. I got my kid an Xbox 360. I threw it on the floor. Boom, that's yours. I got every possible, imaginable accessory that there is. Everyone you can think of, the cordless, wireless, bang-bang, the flip-flop, the yip-yap, everything you could possibly think of. Even threw in an HD plasma so everybody could see it beautifully. A couple of dozen games and said, hey, we're off to a good start. One day I come home and I said, hey, son, you mind if I play the game? You're only sitting there over in the corner. Maybe Dad can give it a shot. You know what he says to me? No, that's mine. Wait your turn. Needless to say, I did a 180 on the 360. And now that sucker sits comfortably in my own personal home theater. And I'm the only one with the key. You know why? Because everything in that baby is mine. Today we're going to talk about stewarding, stewardship of ownership. Stewardship refers to the way time, talents, material possessions. That's a good word, isn't it? Because that's about ownership. Let's do it again. Stewardship refers to the way time, talents, material possessions, or wealth are used or given for the service of God. Hmm. Interesting, right? There actually, when we talk about ownership, in fact, this is this is the bigger subject today. In fact, I, I even though we've called it stewarding ownership, could I tell you kind of a, a parenthetical, kind of a uh, my own abbreviated thought concerning ownership? And that is ownership that is good and ownership that is bad, the contra of those two, the, 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 the struggle between those two has to do with our heart. And I would like to say that what we want to produce in all of our lives is a stewardship of a generous heart. A heart that's like God's heart. The way to have stewardship of our lives, uh, the way to have a, a, a generous heart is to have God, is to, is to know who you are in Him. But the word ownership has a couple different directions and meanings. Can I, can I share them with you? So they're both in your notes here. Number one, ownership is the legal right to use, to possess, and give away a thing. You own it. Ownership can be tangible, such as personal property and land, or it can be intangible things, such as intellectual property rights. You know, the way I think, what I created, how, you know, what I made. Um, and so the ownership of that means that there are things that we have that we call our possessions. And ownership means you have a right to do with it what you want, right? But there's another direction in ownership that's, and by the way, that first word, that I, uh, that first meaning, can be good or bad. You understand? 
I mean, you can take something that, quote, belongs to you, that you have possession of, and you can use it in a bad way. You can use money in a bad way. You can use your talents in a bad way. Right? Or a good way. So ownership in itself is not necessarily the problem. The problem exists not in owning something or taking possession of it or feeling you have possession of it. It's in the heart of what you do with that ownership. So there is a positive perspective to ownership, and it's in the, the definition of this next term. It is taking ownership. It's something that we would wish for everybody in this church as to, quote, for instance, your ministries here. Uh, our team that works music every week. I want you to understand they've taken ownership of this, not to say this is my position, nobody can have it. They say this is ministry the Lord has opened to me. I will do whatever I've got to invest in it. Now, it's really sad that, uh, <laughs> that Jason's guitars and stuff went bad today. and He was trying to struggle and fix them and make them work. But you know what? He has spent literally thousands of dollars on, on buying equipment. And the team that you see up here, they probably are the only people in our church that invest every week or every month into a fund that just takes care of buying PA systems and, and equipment and making sure that the ministry of music is funded. They go beyond just their time. Yeah. Why, why do they do that? Because they took ownership of it. And once again, I remember years ago in church, uh, you didn't dare, quote, put somebody else on the piano if the person that's been on the piano has been on the piano 20 years because they believe that's their ministry and nobody else but do you understand I don't know if you've ever been in a church like that the organist was the organist for ever since Moses came across right um, but that's not the way it is with this team and it's, it's surely every ministry we want people to take ownership of it Lee and, and Steve way back we said you know we'd like to have a coffee bar back there and, and would y'all be in charge? Well, they said, sure. Now, I don't know if you know this, but they don't, they don't own the coffee bar. In fact, they, they not only make coffee, they have several other couples that they've got involved with making coffee, so they don't have to do it every week. And after a while, they said, you know what? We're going to buy the coffee. And so they started buying the coffee. So the money goes into the pot, goes to missions. And then they said, we're going to buy the creamers. And then they, somebody on the team said, no, I'm going to buy the creamers. And then the next thing you know, they're saying, let's buy some donuts and let's put out some cakes. And then do you know that they fund all of that by themselves? The church doesn't put a penny in it. And I said, oh, come on, turn in your receipts and we'll let that money go. And they said, no, this is our ministry. This is what we want to do. This is... We, so to take ownership, that's what this word means. What does taking ownership mean? At its core, taking ownership at work means taking initiative and responsibility for your growth and the success of your team or organization. Every good team needs players willing to step up and take ownership of, as opposed to wanting to blame others for mistakes or challenges. If you didn't know this, we are a team here at CAU. And everybody who works here and ministers here are part of the team. And so, therefore, if you're taking care of the nursery, you're taking care of, of the coffee bar, or you're taking care of uh, the worship team or the, any other ministry that's here, you want to take ownership of it. And that means you're going to put your heart into it. You're going to do the very best you can. You're going to stick with it. You're going to work hard. You're going to find ways to make it better. And, and if need be, you might have to, you know, buy a package of diapers. You might have to buy some coffee or some creamers or, or, or buy some guitar fixings. I, I, I want you to know that, that uh, it's so important that we have the right context to the word ownership. I was thinking about it. What's, what's the, one of the first words your little kids learn when they grow up? Oh, come on, you read the notes. The first word, I think, is no. No, the second word is mine, mine, mine. You know, the joy in life as a parent is to find a kid that will say yes. And then say, you can have it. You can play with it. I'll share with you. Does your heart as a parent just blossom? I'm a parent. I've had six kids and a whole bunch of past little grandkids. Um, watching your kids grow up and take responsibility for the fact of what belongs to Mom, Pop, and, and Mimi. You know, I, I mean, 
mean, our house is, we, we want our kids to enjoy it. But if our kids ever had a nasty attitude about stuff, that's my chair. I always sit in that chair. You can't have that chair. That's my chair. I'd, be in, I'd, I'd, I'd struggle with that, right? Like some people do with pews and seats in the sanctuary. Uh-huh, uh-huh. This was a cry from a mama. She said, mine is a common battle cry around our house. When we hear it echoing through our home, we know the fragile peace that has existed between the children has been shattered again. So we're going to start talking about uh, what is mine and what's not mine. We're going to talk about ownership for a little bit today. And when you talk about the heart, the generous heart that responds the right way to the right kind of ownership. Can I tell you that to begin with, this is a topic we very seldom talk about. We, we don't, I don't preach on it much. Um, and there's a couple reasons. Number one, I, I think our church family is very um, generous. And our church body as a whole does great with giving. As a pastor, I had decided a long time ago I would not ever figure out or try to figure out who gives and who doesn't. I don't get my finger into the tithe and the lack of it or there. Now, I could and maybe should sometimes because I want to tell you this. The way a person gives to the Lord very often defines their heart toward God and their faithfulness to the Lord and also whether or not they're having problems with situations because of their not being generous in their heart. You know, some people talk about the tithe and they say, what in the world is a tithe? Well, the word tithe simply means one-tenth. And, and it seems to be that there's a struggle with this as whether or not it's pertinent for today and should Christians have to tithe. And you can debate it all day long if you want. I, I don't have to, to worry about it because I'll tell you what I believe. I believe very simply that tithe not only was a principle of, of the law and the commandments of the Lord to the to people of Israel, but the reason God did that was because they didn't want to have a personal relationship with God. And they said to God, just lay it out and tell us what we got to do, and we'll just do it. And so God laid it out. And these laws, the law was that you were to give a tithe, the tenth. In fact, when you brought your, 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 you know, your wheat harvest in and you started bundling them up, you took the first tenth of that, of that, of that wheat and you brought it to the Lord. Or if you had sheep born, you'd, you'd take... You know, out of every ten sheep, you the first one that was born would be the tithe. And so the Lord asked them to do this because they didn't want to just have a relationship with him. As though if they had a relationship with him, their giving would be generous without a command. Truthfully, the giving of a grateful heart happened before the law. Abraham gave to Melchizedek. A tenth because, and the Bible says of Melchizedek, it seems to imply that he probably was pre incarnate Christ and that he was Jesus and that Jesus actually had helped Abraham win the battle for his nephew Lot. And as a result of the spoil of that battle, he was able to, to come back and he said, and he gave to Melchizedek this offering. Now, it's a generous heart. So it was there before. And when the Old Testament ends, it is though the, the, the prophet for the Lord's anointing is saying, I got a problem with you because your heart is far from me in worship and you bring to me nasty stuff that doesn't matter. I mean, you, you, a sacrifice, you'll find the, uh, an animal that's crippled and lame and blind and, and you'll give that as though that's a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. You, your heart is not generous toward me in your worship. And, and he was disturbed with it. So much so that he just simply said, you know what, you want to test me? Test me with this. Bring your tithe into the storehouse and see if I don't pour out a blessing that you can't contain. And then we say, okay, we come to the New Testament. We're not under the law anymore. Well, there are principles of law that are, are always still in place. I mean, the Lord said, don't commit adultery. So now that we're under the law, we, not under the law, we're in the New Testament, we can go commit adultery. What did Jesus say? Jesus came along and said, let me tell you, it says in the law, don't commit adultery. I'm telling you, don't even look on a woman to lust after you've done so. So he took the law and made it even bigger. The whole Testament, the whole New Testament is full of, of descriptions of things that go beyond just giving, the giving without, in 1 Corinthians 13. If we gave everything we've got, but we don't have love, it's 
empty, right? Jesus said to a bunch of Pharisees, he said, you're so, so picky. You, you go out to your little herb garden, you, you pick ten leaves of mint. You bring one leaf of mint to the, to the temple. You, you, you bring anise, you, one little leaf of anise. You, you, know, you, you do these things, and you're just so, but you know what you've forgotten? You've forgotten the better and bigger things of love and justice and judgment and, and righteousness. And, and, and then Jesus said, and you should be tithing. But you ought to be going beyond that. So I, I'm, not, I'm not into making this a law, but what I want to say to you is that, that we've got to understand the heart of giving is not the heart of taking from you because God needs it. I don't know if you know this, but he doesn't need our money. But you know what? It's like being a daddy. I want my kids to know when they come to my house and sit on my couches, it's my couch. I own it all. But one day I'm going to be gone. It's going to be theirs. So everything I have belongs to them. And even though in these scriptures I'm going to share in just a second, we don't own anything. We own everything if we belong to him. So if on this side of eternity, on this side of his kingdom come to earth where we'll have everything he has, on this side he says, I want to see if you can steward well your ownership. I want to see if you can steward well, if you can have a generous heart toward me and the kingdom of heaven while on this side because it will help define how you can be blessed in future in the kingdom of heaven. Let me read you a couple of scriptures. A cocky attitude, Deuteronomy 8, 17. We might say, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. It belongs to me. This car belongs to me. How many of you own a car? Everybody who owns a car but still paying payments on it, put your hand down. See, you didn't own the car. You say, I own a car. You're still paying payments. If you don't pay payments, you own the car, right? Keep your hand up. How many of you have to pay insurance on that car? You don't own that car. That car owns you. <laughs> I don't know if you didn't know that. My daddy told me the moment you get a car, son, you'll be poor. <laughs> oh, I'd rather so or not. But I, Deuteronomy, if we're not careful, we say, well, I've gotten this thing. This is by my, my hand. But Deuteronomy 8.18 says, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So maybe everything you quote own, you own because of his blessing on your life. That might make some difference, right? C.S. Lewis, listen to this quote. Every faculty you have, your power of thinking or of moving your limbs from moment to moment is given you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not, in a sense, his own already. So that when we talk of a man doing anything of God or giving anything to God, I'll tell you what it was really like. It's like a small child going to his father and saying, Daddy, give me $5 to buy you a birthday present. Of course, the father does, and he is pleased with the child's present. It is all very nice and proper, but only an idiot would think that the father is $5 to the good on that transaction. Got it? Interesting scripture, and I'll quit on this one, 1 Corinthians 9, 17, this New Living Translation. Although God gives us all things richly to enjoy, nothing is ours. Nothing really belongs to us. God owns everything. We're responsible for how we treat it and what we do with it. While we complain about our rights here on earth, the Bible constantly asks, what about your responsibilities? Owners have rights. Stewards have responsibilities. Now, I'm not trying to say the scripture isn't right because it is right. And the heart of it all is right. If you understand all these scriptures, and we'll try to deal with some of these as we go on. There is this truth that as a steward, I'm responsible to take care of what I have because in essence, inevit inevitably, it all belongs to God. If, if, if God was looking down on somebody to bless because he knows you have a generous heart and you steward well the things he's given you and you're going to bless others and you're going to do things for the kingdom, do you think he might want to give you more? 
Was that too thick? Did that come on too, too quickly? However, if you're stingy about everything, including a tithe, I'm just arguing away, I'm not going to give him a tenth. Well, you can have that attitude, but you know what? If I was God, I wouldn't give you much because you're stingy and you don't honor him. So the honoring of uh, him is saying, I have a generous heart about the kingdom of heaven. I want you to learn the principles of today because I want you to experience the blessings of God because as you are good stewards of ownership, he's going to give you more to own because he knows that even though you own it, you have the rights over it. You have been given houses and lands and cars and things and stuff. Even though he's blessed you, he knows that your ownership is to take care of it. You've, you've set up a budget. You're working well. You're not going to give foolishly. You're not going to take some bill money and give it to some evangelist coming through and saying, have some seed faith and plant this $1,000, and you ain't got the $1,000 except that you're, you know, I, I, there's, there is a, a reasonableness. There's a righteousness in the way you do things when you think, think through as stewards. Stewards do well in all of it. But as you give and as you share, you have a heart that says, Lord, I just want to be generous about you in the kingdom of heaven. And God says, you know what? I can trust you to own more. Because truthfully, bottom line, say it once again, everything that's his is ours. And one day we're going to inherit it all. The principle of tithing was one that I was taught as a kid. And that is to simply be faithful with what God gives you and take a, a portion of it to begin with and give it to the Lord. I will tell you that I learned as a kid that my mom and dad taught me to take 10 cents out of every dollar. When I first started working at 13, I worked the whole summer to b have enough money so that I could buy my first baritone horn because my mom and dad didn't, didn't have the money. I, that was my allowance. I was allowed to work. I was allowed to be a part of the family. I, when I started working at uh, a little store called Bargain City USA, that's where my bargain life came from, it was like a dollar dollar city but they had clothes and everything else I bought all my clothes from that time on I want you to be blessed but I will tell you this when we began to give I realized it wasn't just a matter of being legalistically 10% I, because I wanted to do more than that and I started saying Lord can we do more and when we first got married we took 10% out to always tithe and we always took we took another 10% and set it aside as gifts that we could give to missionaries or we could give to somebody in need and we started doing that on a 20% basis. That's just the way we were. I just I want to do that. And, and I have ever since then realized that the Lord sometimes give me, gives to me what I call handfuls on purpose. If you don't understand that, go back and read the book of Ruth. But when I, I'll get sometimes, somebody will come up and say, Pastor, hey, or just, I mean, it might be, it might be in the blue, out of the blue, or something comes back in the mail like you overpaid something. And they see, I take that money and put it in my wallet in a hidden place for me to be able to get something special and, and I'm so excited about it until all of a sudden the Lord brings somebody near me that needs something and then I go oh that was what that money was for <laughs> so it's a bless me fund and I pull it out to give it away because I just got a feeling it's a generous heart that the Lord wants to see so yeah it was a hard process there were lots of tests and I got lots of testimonies but I'm going to let some other folks tell you their testimonies. David Tyner is going to come and talk with us right now. Come here, Brother David. Ownership is something that you can either have it as an example as you're growing up, or you have to learn it uh, through certain ways. And um, I lived in Lakeland, Florida, and grew up there. And I got married at 24 to a beautiful lady young lady and she was 22 and uh, we, we became Christians together within months I, I, we, we started going to First Assembly which you've heard Pastor talk about Pastor Strader and it was uh, great teaching but uh, soon after we had a child a couple years later I wasn't really tithing I wasn't given to God because we were barely making it, uh, and, and I'm 
sure everyone here has said the same thing. Man, we're, we're barely making it. How can we give to God? Uh, and my wife was saying, Dave, we've got, we've got to start. I, we're, we are barely making it. We've got to start. And, and sometimes I think God just knows what to do to get our attention. Bam. And, and he knew uh, it probably required something a little bit supernatural on my behalf. So we, we came to a point, like I said, soon after our son was born, and, and we needed desperately 500 bucks. We, we had to pay for something that, that, and we didn't have any way to, to ask for it. We, we, didn't, we didn't know where it was going to come from. And, and Sue Dawn pulled me over to the sofa, and she, get, she grabs my hands, and she says, Dave, we're not even going to tell anyone of our need because uh, we don't have anyone that we can ask. Uh, we're just going to pray for God to, to, to supply that need. And... Uh, and we had like I think about three weeks to come up with it, and 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 every night she she grabbed me and she and we'd pray, and we'd say God we don't know I mean we don't know but but you're gonna have to supply this, and and how many of y'all know God waits till the the eleventh hour fifty ninth minute, one day before we absolutely had to have this money or we would lose really an opportunity for something for her health. Uh, I get a call at work, and and I, I deliver furniture back then, and she's crying, and and I, she's saying, "Dave, you got to come home. You got to come home." And I'm going, "What's wrong, baby?" And she's going, "No, you've got to come home." So I, I told my boss, he's great, and and I, I rushed home thinking, I don't know what I'm going to find, and she's sitting at the dining table and just sobbing, and she, and I said, "What's wrong?" And she pointed to an envelope sitting in front of her and um, I opened it up she, I think she said open it up and you're going to listen to your wife so I, I went ahead and opened this envelope up and it had five $100 bills in it and the, the amazing thing is is that she said that she heard a car park or, or a door slam and we had a fenced in yard and we had a black chow, and, and this chow was, it was friendly to us, but it was a great protector, and he would literally run up to the fence and grab it with his teeth and just shake it. And she said she looked out, and this, this little crumpled clothed man got out of his car, looked at the dog, opened the gate, walked right by the dog, knocked on the door, and then... Uh, she don't want going to answer because she didn't know who he was. And uh, he knocked one more time. He taped something to the door and then just walked out. God sent what we had been praying for. She, and she says, David was an angel. <laughs> and, and I believe it with all my heart, it was an angel. He could have put it on a human's heart to just out of the blue bring something that no one knew about in the exact amount that we needed. But God got my attention. And even though we had little, we started tithing. Um, it, it's all easier to give offerings, to tell you the truth, because you see the need in front of you, you know, and, and you see that person needs. And, and yeah, I can, I can give... Forty dollars to that need, you know. Even at a young age, we did things like that. But to to literally just budget it in there with my electric bill and my house payment and my car payment every week. And you know what? We were still tight, but we didn't go under. And we started seeing it grow, and and we started seeing blessings come, and supplies being given to us that we would have never expected. My wife had an unwavering faith back then, all the way to the end. We were married 14 years and she passed away. And right to the end, I mean, she was just saying that she couldn't wait to go home and be with Jesus because it's right at Christmas time. And uh, But she had such an unwavering faith, but we grew together in the Lord. I made the money. 
she stayed home with the, the baby and she relied on me making the right decisions and she knew she couldn't force me she couldn't push me so God got my attention because of her prayers and uh, it's never stopped I mean uh, you you keep growing and growing and growing in your faith and sometimes you get bought back just to tell you the truth but you, I'm, I always know that God's got me a couple of years ago my, my bathroom was literally collapsing uh, and I have a little country home so but my master bathroom in my bedroom it was collapsing on one whole half and, and I didn't have reserves I didn't know how I could pay for like a major construction and uh, and the few people that would see it or heard about it they'd go Dave what are you going to do and I'm going I don't know but I'm, I'll tell you what God's going to do it uh, he's going to take charge of it he's going to take he's going to supply the answer because I think a lot of times the ownership comes with speaking your faith out of what you believe God is going to do. Well, uh, let me let me add to this though, because this is scripturally, I, I think sound. When the Lord says in the in Malachi, and and you know what, if we don't believe that all of the word is the word, if you can take something and just dock it and say no, nah, that don't work here, then then all of that passage should be thrown out. Let's tear all of Malachi out. But Malachi is full of admonitions that we love and we're excited about. I mean, it talks about marriage and, and doing things the right way. It talks about the Lord coming and returning and the very last and God bringing the hearts of the children to the parents. I mean, all these promises. But right in the middle of that, God says, I, I want you to know it hurts my heart when your worship is so flimsy that you have stolen from me. That's the term he uses when you have taken the tenth which is the designated part that belongs to me that says you are a part of the family and you you have said this is my this belongs to God so I'm going to re reserve it and give it to him New Testament says do so lay it aside on the first day of the week bring it and 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 invest it so the in the in the work of the kingdom so the, the Lord said if you will just test me here with see if it doesn't work give to me your tithe and your offerings and see if I won't open up heaven and pour you out a blessing. Now, that's cool, but we don't give because we're saying, boy, I, you know what? I need a new floor, so I'm going to start giving today to get it. This became a lifestyle with David and so his faithfulness to give a tithe and to be always there is, is then a dependence on the word that God says, see if I won't do this. He had the right to say then, and and I love the the comment that you tied your your comments. I mean, you you started a re, a writing your your terminology, so he was able to say the Lord's going to take care of this. The Lord's going to take care of this. And people who have been faithful to the Lord have no problem believing the Lord's going to take care of this because it becomes a lifestyle. I'm telling you, out of all of my giving, the Lord has outgiven me, given me. He's outgiven me over and over and over. And these miracles that start to happen, it's wonderful. He says, not only will I do that, but I'll curse the devourer that eats up your stuff. Some people say, I can't give because I just have all these bills. Well, maybe you need to let God curse the devourer for you. Maybe you're, you're having problems with bills because you haven't honored God. You see, when I give him a tenth, then that means the 90% belongs to him. I've set it aside and sanctified. Devil can't touch that 90%. And if should something happen, like my floor fall in in the bathroom, then I can believe God's going to take care of it. So back to your story, your floor fell in, so, you started confessing. Yeah, it, I work in an affluent community. Uh, I, I do security out at the Cliffs Glassy, and, and there's people that are very affluent out there. And so uh, one lady found out about it. And she put it on a, a, a website that they have for the community out there and said, you know, Dave's going through this. I, I, I built up a good reputation with them. Uh, I, I feel like they're my family. They treat me like family, a lot of them. And so uh, all of a sudden, someone came down and dropped off a check. And come to find out, this lady had put my situation on this thing, and, and the check was for like $100. And I'm going, well, th 
and she says, I hope this helps with your floor. And I thought someone had just said, I didn't know the magnitude of that it had gone out to the whole mountain. And so over a period of, I think they, they put like a three-week uh, time limit. Uh, they, want, they said if you can help in any way, uh, you know, try to get in by this time. I, I had $5,600 given to me. And I and and during this time I wasn't even I was trying to find a contractor that could just come and tell me what was wrong. I had plumbers that came and they said no, it's it's I don't see anything that would be causing it. And and so I was trying to get contractors to come. And I was getting frustrated to tell you the truth because I couldn't. People would say yeah I'll come I'll come and then they'd never come and I was thinking like God why are they not coming? And it's because he was shutting the doors till the right person rode through. And, and this man that I know that came through and did a lot of work out there building these million-dollar homes, um, he came through, and, and I said, Mr. Bergeron, would, would you just come and look and see if you could just give me an idea? I, I said, I know you're too busy, but would you come and just give me an idea and what I could expect and maybe suggest somebody that could do it? And, he, and we've talked about God before coming through. Let me tell you, every time that you talk about God during your daily life, it's going to come in emergencies, you know. And, and so he says, yeah, I'll come, I'll come this afternoon. So he came. He found out that I had, when I moved in my house, um, it was five years at that time, seven years now, but I, had, I bought a brand-new refrigerator. And I said, don't hook the ice maker up. Uh, that, I had problems with it ice makers before I don't even want it so Home Depot came and delivered it and they tied it or tied it off and come to find out there was a pin drop that went for five years and in that period of time it caused uh, the things underneath the house to start collapsing and so therefore most people wouldn't have caught that but he did and I, and I told him, I said, you know, I, I, they've been taking a collection for me out here. Um, so can you give me an idea of what it's going to cost? And, and he goes, he says, I'll tell you what. He said, I can get me and my son to come and do it. And uh, it'll take us a couple of days. He said, how much have you collected? And I said, uh, $5,600. And he goes, and he kind of did his eyes up like that. And he goes, well, I won't lose any money. He says, I won't make much. But he says, he says, I'll go ahead and do it. And so a period of a month that we had to let it dry out, we had to put some fans under there uh, and let it dry out and stop that pin drop leak. And not only did he fix my floor, but I have, like, ceramic I mean it's the bathroom looks a hundred times better as it is so not only did God take care of it he gave me better and and I believe it's because I spoke God every chance I could get out there I don't cram God down people's throats that's what's going to make people run uh, it, I might get fired you know they don't want you to do that out there but but you know who you can you know God shows you and I am continually saying, you know, uh, God, God will take care of it. Uh, I don't know how he's going to, but he's going to take care of it. Then when it happens, then they'll go, whatever happened to your floor? And I go, this is what God did. And then you tell about all the great things that happened and how it led up. And, and you can see their eyes, and whether they're Christians or not, it has, it has sunk into their spirit, uh, maybe a, a brand new seed. I just know that the, any money that I've ever given to God or been directed to give to God, he has multiplied more than enough, it's more than I could ever hope for. I think that's wonderful. Let's give David a hand. Thank you. So I'm going to give you a testimony just about um, a friend of mine, actually. Um, he's not saved. He does not know the Lord at all. Um, he was raised in Honduras and um, came here when he was eight years old. When I met him, I was in Atlanta, 
and I was starting a new job as a salesperson. It was a hard job. I was in sales. I had a quota I had to meet every month. This guy could barely speak English, and I'm not, I'm not being ugly to him at all. I'm, this is actually a testimony about how great this guy is, but he just didn't know the Lord. He was very lost. He had a potty mouth. The first week I was around him, I can tell you, I went home and I thought I was going to have to have a lobotomy. I mean, I genuinely felt like I had been abused and assaulted because of the words coming out of this man's mouth. I had never been in corporate America, so I didn't know that those four-letter words were adjectives. I just had never known that. <laughs> so it was, you know, this is effing beautiful. I didn't know that was a thing, but whatever. So after a first week, I was like, this guy's a heathen. And he, I, w I was offended. I was bothered by him. And y'all, everything he touched turned to gold. And I was bewildered. I was actually more than bewildered. I was frustrated because I was like, Lord, I love you and I serve you and I cannot sell anything close to what this guy is selling. I was frustrated and I was like, you know, he's got a potty mouth. He does not hardly speak English. He would literally, we had a, a break room and every day he would come by my desk and say, hey, um, meet, me in the, meet me in the chicken. We're going to get some coffee. And I was like, in the chicken? And it took me weeks to realize he was calling the kitchen the chicken. So, you know, I'm thinking, this guy is not the brightest star in the sky. Basically because he was from Honduras and this was his second language. But either way, in the business world, you've got to be able to communicate well to sell well. So when you have this as your second language and you don't know what a chicken in a kitchen is or the difference, how are you selling $10,000 a month? When my quota is 3500 and I'm about to rob a bank to make quota, okay? And I got very frustrated, and I went to the Lord, and I was like, Lord, you, you know, I'm supposed to be your favorite. And this fool over here is touching stuff, and it's turning to gold. And the Lord very clearly said, ask him. Ask him what his secret is. And I went to this man who does not know Jesus. He goes to a Catholic mass twice a year at Christmas and Easter. Um, and he tells me that he is superstitious and that his grandmother, who brought him over from Honduras, he didn't have a father, he was raised by aunties and grandmas, told him that if he would give away 20% of his income, he would never need anything. So he was taking his paycheck every week and giving 20% of it away to someone less fortunate. His grandmother specified you should look for orphans, widows, and homeless people. And if you will give 20% of your income away, you will never need anything. And when I'm telling you this man currently now has two homes, he's just bought a house in Florida because he didn't like the weather in Atlanta, and each of his homes are half a million dollars, but he is walking in abundance because he's walking in a principle. And God said that there are laws that he's put in place. Remember when I talked to you about gravity? It doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. Jump off a building and see if gravity cares. There are laws and principles in place that when you obey them, you walk in abundance. And this man who doesn't know Jesus and doesn't serve Jesus is walking in the goodness of our Father because he has realized that I can give 20% of my income to people that need it more and something good is going to happen in my life. And he even told me one time, I tried to lower it to 15% and it didn't work. And he said, and then he said, Whenever I'm having a rough month and I can't make a sale, he said, I just find somebody to give $1,000 to. And he said, and I always get blessed. He doesn't call it blessed. He said, I always get my sale. Um, every day we went to lunch together in Atlanta, him and me and five or six other people in the office. And every single day, not one day in the seven years that I was there in that office, did he ever buy himself a meal and not buy one for someone else. And it wasn't for the people he was with. He bought a meal, and on the way back to the office, we worked down by CNN centers. There's a lot of homeless people in Atlanta. Every single day, he, he bought an extra meal, and we were walking back, handed it to somebody on the street. So whether you're God's favorite or not, God's principles work. Now, I'm going to pass it off to Mark and Melissa Ward. You guys come up. Sorry to everyone online, but I'm going to have everybody in here look at the back just for a second. You see all the nice looking gentlemen back there. Uh, the one with the headphones on is our son, Matt. Matt, raise your hand because Matt's a big part of the story too. 
Um, we have two daughters that you guys probably haven't seen. Um, this is Melissa, and I'm Mark. And uh, we've been here since about September with you guys, and we really love you all because you've welcomed us and loved us, too. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we we want to pick up on some of the things. A lot of what we would have shared has been covered. The Malachi scripture, uh, we were both saved late in our our uh, life. We were both 30 when we were saved. We, um, I, I grew up in a church that allowed you to be comfortable but not pressed in to really understand God and the relationship that you needed to have with Jesus. Uh, Melissa's family never went to church, and that's part of the story too. Um, we can't tell you our whole testimony. We did a lot of dumb stuff. We made bad investments. We had car payments. We had student loans. We had credit card debt all the things that you shouldn't do, but we did it, and we were just underwater. And we, we become Christians, and all of a sudden we start to hear tithing. And when I grew up, it was an annual giving campaign, and it was the church trying to get your money, um, but then this tithing concept. And so one, one day we're hearing the first time about tithing and the scripture in Malachi, and Pastor Mark has on... Uh, the, the sheet there, 8 and 9, chapter 3, 8 and 9, add 10. Write down 10 because you have to look at 10. That's where the, the real press in is. Like, prove it. Prove me. Test me. Yeah. And Melissa, we came home and Melissa said, hmm, you think we should really try God because we don't have enough to even pay the credit card bills and all these other things regularly? You think we should try it? And I'm like, well, what do you think? She said, I think we should. I think we should. And so we started to tithe. Right off the top, the top of everything, as Pastor Mark said, you know, the first fruit. And we didn't have that to give. And all of a sudden, our washer would break, and a check would come in the mail from something for the amount of the washer. <clears throat> Within one year, we had about $70,000 of debt on credit cards and um, student loans and things. That debt was gone. And, and we can't really tell you how, how that happened. Um, but during that same period, we had been married for like seven years at that point. We hadn't had children, and we desperately wanted children. And we had decided we're going to adopt. So we talked to a local adoption agency, and they said it cost $12,000, and let us know when you're ready to really go forward. So we were tithing, and um, miraculously, we got $12,000. And a couple weeks after we got the $12,000... Well, we saved $12,000. <laughs> we, we saved $12,000. It took a while. Yeah. But we got the $12,000, and that's what they told us it would take. <clears throat> and God spoke to us and said, I need you to give it away. So our church, we, the church that had been teaching us and loving us and helping us grow... Uh, we were packed in a building, and we needed a new building. The, the pastor said, just pray and see what God tells you. And we both knew the same amount, and we gave it away. A couple weeks later, there was another thing that God pressed in. And then um, to this day, Melissa's parents still don't know the third part of the story unless they're watching today or watch sometime. Um, they had never been to church, and we went back to Virginia. They were sitting with a group that was getting ready to start a church, and God pressed on us, and she elbowed me, and I elbowed her, and we both knew we gave away all of our $12,000. Two weeks later at work, I had three people come up to me and say, have you ever heard of Bethany Christian Services? They, we were in the Quad Cities in um, Iowa, um, Illinois area along the Mississippi River, Bethany Christian Services was a couple hours away, and so we called them. Well, and I had joined a women's group, um, and someone there had actually told me about Bethany Christian Services. While he was learning about it at work, I was learning about it in my women's group. So, so we go halfway to Iowa City and meet with a lady from Bethany Christian Services, and she said we have about um, 28 uh, people in line. We place about 14, 15 kids a year, so we're doing the math, about two years, and it costs $17,600. And we're like, oh, boy, that's a little more than the 12 that we just gave away. 
So we're, but we're thinking, okay, you know, we can figure this out. We can always figure it out. And uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> two years. Right. Yeah, we, you know, we have plenty of time. We're just saving, saving, saving. Yeah. And on the way home from that meeting, she calls us and she said, "Do you have a profile ready?" Which was a book that you put together to give to birth moms to look at you. And I went, "No." She goes, "Well, could you get one ready and FedEx it by Monday? We have someone who wants to see your profile." What? Across the next month, she asked me twice a week, what are we going to do about the money? What are we going to do about the money? And I'm like, oh, you know, I, I can always create a plan, which is part of what got us in debt. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I had a business venture with a guy, and we lost $50,000. That's part of how we got in debt. And so Mark plans didn't work very well, and, but I told her, I'll make a plan. So I, I left work one day. I went to a factory, and I was coming back by, and I went through the parking lot of the credit union and got out to go in. And I just heard God speak. Don't go in. You need to go to work. I even looked around. I'm like, you know, who's telling me that? So I got in my car, and I drove to work. And as I was going into work, my boss's boss was coming out, and he said, Earl needed to see you. So I, uh, I went in and went to Earl's office, and I'm thinking, oh, this doesn't sound good. Maybe, you know, there's a reason I shouldn't have borrowed money. Maybe t times are tough. So I go to Earl's office, and he said, last year was a little down for the company, but this year it was a little bit better. And he hands me an envelope across the desk like David got, and it was a bonus for $17,700. <laughs> Two weeks later, we get a call from Bethany Christian Services, and we go down to Des Moines, and two months later, we're in the hospital when Matthew was born, and we bring him home. We don't have time to share, and we have the same stories with our girls. God just spoke. God provided. God took care of things. I'm going to run over like two minutes, but I have another story that I need to share to, to tie it out. Um... Every time we would give, God would outgive. And the first time we gave, the next time God spoke to us to give, it was 10 times the amount of the first time. And then the next time, it was 10 times the amount of the first time. Uh, I mean, 10 times the amount of the second time. So every time, he multiplies. And um, I was trying to figure out how to share this um, I was, uh, we were in the middle of Illinois, uh, I had a big meeting, God had spoken to me 10 days earlier to fast, and I'd been fasting just with juice, one morning I get up and he says, just water today. I have all the Caterpillar factories from all across the world coming together for a big meeting that I'm hosting, and I go all through the day, and God's just, you know, taking care of things. I get on a plane that night, fly to Chicago, and I'm supposed to fly to Cincinnati, and God said, the, the reason that you've been fasting is right in front of you. And I said, okay. So I'm, I'm, now I'm paying attention. And um, I get on the plane, and I'm up in the first seat, and it's one of those little planes where you have a seat and then another seat beside the galley, and then you have one and two and one and two. And um, when they're loading the plane, we're making a little small talk, uh, the, the flight attendant and uh, a few people up there, and God says, she's the reason you've been fasting. Okay, tell me more. So he told me what I'm supposed to tell her. And I'm thinking, uh, this is probably one of those chances to meet the air marshals uh, that they have on the plane that you don't know who they are. But, uh, and so we get into the flight, and God prompts me. And I said, okay, um, I, I have to tell you something from God. And she looks at me like, okay. And I said, he says that he wants you to be healed because you've not been feeling well. And he wants me to pray for you. But he also is not happy with the fact that you're not seeking him the way that he wants to because of the unresolved issue in your marriage. And she looked at me, and I'm like, uh-oh. And uh, he, he said, she knows what you're talking about. And I said, you know what he's sharing with you? And she said, yes, I do. And so she goes over, and she gets really busy, and she comes back. And she said, I grew up in Puerto Rico, and part of my family was Catholic, and part of my family was Christian, the way that she described it. And my husband is Muslim. 
and she said, we've, we've been dealing with some stuff, and I've known for a while that I have to work through this. And she goes over, and she, she does the, the flight service, and she's putting everything away, and she comes over to me and stands there, and she said, well, I said, well, she said, aren't you going to pray for me? So in front of this whole plane full of people, I take her hands and we pray. And I get off the plane, I don't give her my name, I don't want her to follow up, I want her to spend all of her time with God because he just dropped something heavy on her. And so I go down to the rental car place and I'm waiting for my baggage and I call Melissa and I tell her and she's laughing and she's like, yeah, you get the fun assignments. <laughs> and I go to the rental car place and they said, uh, you know, you've got a medium-sized car reserved here, but just take whatever you want. So I go out and get the luxury car. And I go over to the Marriott, and they said, well, there's a problem with your reservation. And I'm thinking, they're going to send me somewhere else. And they said, would, would you mind if we upgrade you to the suite? And I'm like, no, that'll be okay. <laughs> and so the next morning, I go to my meeting, and I'm waiting on a guy to fly into the airport because then we have to go up and speak at a university. And um, I go into a little shop, and I say, do you have coffee? And the guy's like, yeah. And so he's back there making it, and he said, do you want cream or sugar? And I said, no. And he gets ready to walk to the cash register, and he stops, and he walks around, and he just hands it to me. And he said, for some reason, I'm supposed to just give you this. So, oh my God, you got my attention. And so I go out to the car, and I'm wanting to call our pastor, and I'm wanting to call Melissa. And then it, it kind of checks me, and I'm like, I don't want anybody to think because I did something that it's about me. And God said, I want you to share the story because I want people to know that if you'll be faithful and obedient in the small things, I can take care of not only your needs, but your wants. It's so true that when we, we just honor God, we honor him by our living, we steward our generous heart we steward our ownership we say it all belongs to you anyway Lord but you know what you've given this to me to hold and to have and I literally have the rights of ownership I can give it away I can do what I want with it but I ask you to write my steps so that everything in my life do you have any money in your pocket do I, look, I'm not going to take it from you I'm just asking do you have any money would you get it out? Anything? Anything you got? You know what this is? It's you in spendable form. This reflects talent, sacrifice, hours, maybe some tears. But it's you in spendable form. And if you can have a generous heart to where you don't hold on to you, so tightly that you become selfish. It's mine. Because everything you have needs to belong to Him. Your time, your, your willingness to give of yourself, your talents, your, your abilities, and this, it's just you in spendable form. If you're willing to do that, if you can have a a stewardship mentality. I'm, I'm going to take care of this and use it well for the kingdom of heaven, for, for, for a purpose. If you can have that heart, God's going to say, oh, I just love to build you bigger, to make your life bigger, to show you how much 